Okay, and here we are with game two from Cut versus his opponent Simon Aimstrong. This time around, Cut will be playing as the PE versus his opponent on the northern side, uh, Aimstrong as the Americans. Okay, so Ryan gonna be getting this started in five, four, three, two, and one. Okay, so this time around, the PE player, Cut, will be on the south side, whilst the Americans will be on the north side. Okay, so do you think there might be anything different this time around? Well, uh, Cut's a, a pretty renowned PE player. Uh, obviously, a lot of these players play multiple factions and play them at a very high level. But uh, Cut has spent a lot of time with the PE and with the PE community, and so, uh, you know, there's no doubt that we're going to see some excellent play from him. And I can't wait to see as well. I want to see if there might be anything unusual, but it looks like we've got the we've got two um, PEs, PE Panzer Grenadier, should I say, coming out. The Cat and Crad is capping away, and they're going to the left side of the map. So what could this mean? There's going to be quite a variety of uh, munitions, quite a variety of fuel, and pushing up the left hand side. Do you think there might be a reason for doing that? Well, I think what he's looking to do is he's looking to, um, you know, if you look at what American engineers tend to do, the engineer that builds the barracks tends to run over, grab the fuel, grab the munitions right outside of his base. So what he's looking to do is chase off those engineers before they can get those munitions. Um, something that should be noted is that uh, uh, Simon actually captured that North VP. Again, uh, you know, VPs give you kind of the ability to decide on maps and uh, and are, you know, kind of helpful for um, doing the veto rounds and those kinds of things that go on So, uh, as part of the tournament rules. So he's really focused on some of the VP play, and we're seeing actually the Ketten. Uh, now that the Ketten can't be chased around by the Jeep, it, uh, it actually has the ability to push some infantry around, and Kot's actually using it to really uh, sway the the fight in the Panzer Grenadier's favor. <laughs> that was pretty funny to be seeing that. He's already, the Americans are already getting cut off um, at their strategic point. Um, this is going to be quite an iffy thing. So there's, oh, let's see, there's one rifleman squad out. I believe so, and there's two riflemen just coming out right now, so it doesn't really look like anything unusual going to be coming out from the Americans. Um, from the PE, they have their third Panzer Grenadier squad out, but yet nothing very strange. It seems quite standard textbook-like. Yeah, and uh, you know, and I, I think you're going to see um, a uh, you know a fairly standard, uh, maybe a four rifle, uh, you know, kind of start to M8. Uh, it's common against the PE. It isn't really as effective as it once was, though, and it's something that a lot of American players are beginning to kind of search for some different answers. There's three rifles to WSC that gets done. There's a lot of other options. You see the Panzer Grenadiers here focusing down the uh, engineers as they run up. Um, one of the things to note about veterancy with Panzer Grenadiers, uh, killing a rifleman is worth exactly as much as killing an engineer, and engineers are way easier to kill, so if you want a lot of vet on your PGs, kill engineers. Well, then again, it depends how many engineers are going to be on the field. Uh, there's only t two engineers uh, anyway, but these PGs are absolutely getting surrounded and not looking the absolute best for them. However, they're surprisingly managing to stay alive quite uh, a lengthy time despite the rifleman being up so close. And this Kettenkrat is being so pesky, just getting right up in the faces of uh, Armstrong, but however, being too cocky with it and taking almost too much damage and almost being destroyed, but luckily getting out of there very quickly. The PGs are actually doing a very good job against um, the uh, rifleman. Yet again, they were focusing against the engineers. So I like how the PGs, even though they're uh, not the absolute strongest guys in the beginning, they're limited to the three squads. They're in unison, they're obviously going to be doing quite a decent job. But then again, being pushed back now, the rifleman moving on in to capture some territory. 
Um, what is this? We have defensive operations coming down, so the healing is just about to begin. And so that is very good, but still no signs of any uh, structures coming up. Uh, and and this is something common, and it's a strategy I've been working with um, with my PG game as well. Um, is you know a very heavy Panzer Grenadier start, and uh, using the the power of the G43s to try and um, you know kind of give you an edge early on. Um, you know the extended infantry battles. That's the the obvious choice there is to pick up defensive operations so that you know you're coming back to the field um, a lot uh, more healthy. And, uh, and, you know, with the number of Panzer Grenadiers he's got, he wants to be able to keep those alive so he's not just bleeding manpower unnecessarily. That's definitely right. He's got actually five PGs right now, so it seems like quite an investment on his uh, Panzer Grenadiers. That Kettenkrat is just going down. Um, five PGs, we don't usually see this. People usually stop at four PGs and then move on to their um, structure. However, do we need to see what comes out of this. He's got that defensive operations down. He also has 45 uh, fuel, um, but however, not much manpower. That is just due co course because he has a logistic company coming out. So quite an interesting choice by him. Do you believe that there might be a vampire half-track possibly coming out? No, I, I don't think at this level of play, particularly on longer, I, I don't think you're going to see that. You know, we've obviously played with it a bit. He's he's leapfrogging at this point. He may pick up four-man squads, um, but he will probably do it after he's landed an AT half-track on the ground. So there's no hope in seeing anything unusual. <laughs> so, oh, I suppose we will have to see that um, leapfrogging effect. So the PGs are just combating the riflemen in the building. But what else is coming out from the Americans? They just got their supply yard. Yeah, you have the supply yard up. Um, he's not building any other units currently, so he's hopping right to a motor pool. And, uh, you know, like I said, this is a, a fairly standard four rifle to M8 kind of stall. Right, so he's probably... Um as you, say, as you were saying, Cut's probably going to be leapfrogging to get the AT gun out just due to the fact because there's a rifleman out and they're not even upgraded. So it's likely that there might be some sort of M8 or T17 rush. So it's likely that he will be getting out this uh, Panzer support, support Command. And yes, he is getting it out after all. So we will be seeing the AT half track. So yet again, nothing surprising. It's, it is quite a standard. Uh, game. However, obviously these are great players. They've got their strategies refined. They've got their micro up to par. So it's going to be s good seeing it really come down to who can uh, out macro, out micro the uh, other opponent. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, you see riflemen all the way up outside of the Panzer Elite base trying to decap a fuel. Um, you know, there's there's riflemen uh, currently all inside of the American base, but they have been all over the map. Um, really causing the Panzer League kind of a headache, and it's slowed him down a little bit, which is why you're not seeing like a like a tier one to tier three, and then tier four because of the execution at aim strong here. Um, it's forced Cut to pick up the the light AT half track and bring it out on the field in fear of an M8. Right, and actually, if we actually look at the income of the munitions for the PE player, they've only got plus zero. So that's not only, that's basically zilch. Um, they actually have plus 10 now, but they've stopped at 74 munitions. And that's going to be a, quite a bit of a toll on the light AT half-track. Obviously, you can get out its uh, treadbreaker ability on any uh, M8, which has just managed to come out. But still, that's going to be um, hmm, quite a restrictive sort of thing, since that they're so limited on the munitions. If the M8 can get repaired after the treadbreaker is activated, then it could be it could actually put quite a toll on that light AT half track and using its abilities well especially with the way that uh, Treadbreaker's cost was increased you know now that it By costs uh, 50 munitions it, it it is a fairly hefty you know if if you hit something with it you want to make sure that whatever it is dies fairly quickly and uh, and the AT half tracks doing and making pretty quick work of this uh, we you know, I'd like to see, well, I can't say that I'd like to see suppressive fire because of the uh, munitions cost involved, and he's really got to watch his munitions due to his income. Um, there the M8 goes, and we've got, uh, you know, skirmishing in between the Panzer Grenadiers and the AT half-track. It's time to just get out of there and uh, take your win on the M8 and just run. 
and <laughs> definitely a big one as well because that M8, uh, even with the armored skirts, just out taken out so early on without even managing to get off uh, a single kill, I believe. That's quite a big loss for the Americans. Obviously, they've been doing quite a good job at maintaining the points on the map, trying to decap the PGs, the PEs, um, fuel and such, and they've been doing a very good job with that. Just kind of uh, bad to be seeing them lose an M8 so early on. Do you think it, uh, it might be viable to get another one? Well, he may go for another one, but uh, since he had patterns out on the field, I would expect to see an AT gun, which he just began building. Attention. So the with an AT gun out, out, and then I would consider fielding an M8 if I can back off the uh, the light AT half track and keep it from really being a pain. Right. I think when I'm actually choosing between going for the M8 or the T17, I don't know, I just got this personal opinion that I actually like the uh, T17 more. It does a decent amount of damage against the half-tracks, just as the M8 would, but the nice thing about it is that it's quite effective against the PGs as well, and obviously shoots at a faster rate than the M8. Um, but it's obviously not going to be as armored as the M8 is when it, with its armored skirts. Uh, obviously it's not going to be quite viable to get an M8 anymore just due to the fact that this, since this one is taken out and you do have that light AT half track on the field, you got to start thinking about the future and what else might be coming out on the field from the PGs. Obviously going to be having to combat that. We still have no doctrinal choice from the Panzer Elite. Has the Americans actually decided on anything yet? No, not yet. And we have a uh, triage center up from the Americans. Um, once again trying to cut down on the manpower bleed because he's got almost nothing in the way of manpower just from all of the reinforcing that he's had to do and uh, you know the Panzer Elite taking a, a moment here to run back to base and mass get get healed up because he had no casualties on those squads and so you know he gets healed up um, he just got his four-man squads so he's he's getting uh, you know, reinforce, so he's going to come back to the field even stronger than he was with his infantry presence. And honestly speaking, that's that's going to make a, a very tough run for this uh, rifle and flamer group up here. And I uh, hate to call him a blob, but it's kind of... <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Two big blobs. You know, but with, with G43s, if he, if he focuses down these flamers properly... Um, I think you're uh, you're gonna see a decent route of the American forces here uh, unless cut really um, doesn't get something right in, in the the way this battle plays out we got both flamers out um, there's no point in rushing that green cover uh, you know you're you're not gonna do yourself any good running across the uh, red or the open cover to try and get to those rifles but the PGs over here on the right side are shooting around the cover and as those rifles, uh, you know, he recognizes that in Armstrong and and moves to run them off of the field. So, uh, you know, this is a moment where you move up, you take you take your cover, or you uh, move up as the AT gun is firing in on the AT half track. You move up and try to uh, remove the AT gun from the fight as well. I don't think that was the best of moves from the American there, just moving in on the PGs whilst they had the cover on the hay bales. Um, one of the things to note is actually that the uh, Americans were kind of encompassed there from multiple directions, from multiple sides. And I actually believe I read this somewhere on the um, on the Game Replays forums, and this was actually a while ago, so you have to bear with me. But um, it, was, it was talking about something totally not relevant to the PE. It was talking about motorcycles and their strategies. And when motorcycles uh, used to be a popular sort of thing, um, they were saying what is the most effective way to use these motorcycles and the most effective formation was an encompassing formation. Apparently some sort of math, it was mathematically prove, proven that by doing such an encompassing formation you actually were di uh, dishing out the most damage possible rather than having the motorcycles say in a line and firing. So we saw the sort of thing from the PGs there and you know it's very good they managed to push back the Americans entirely. Yeah, and we also saw, was that an incendiary grenade that I saw tossed right over the uh, the hay bale? Oh, uh, well, it's actually I on fire right was. now. <laughs> Might have been just a, uh, I'm not exactly sure if it was, a hay b if it was an incendiary or if it had to uh, be a, a flamethrower, but to be honest, there's so much going on in the field right at the moment to even think about that. 
Yeah, you've got a, a lot running around. It definitely wasn't a flamethrower squad blowing up because he just lost his first flamethrower squad there in that engagement. Um, so, I, you know, that that tips the P's hand as to have uh, purchased incendiary grenades, which isn't a bad idea in the heavy um, infantry fights that you're seeing here because they do instant damage, um, and then you've got that long, slow burn that, that goes with it. Um, that's going to be helpful for, for driving that off. Um, Cut actually not finishing his tier 2 here. I'm expecting to see um, maybe a mortar half-track out of tier 2. He may even run to Shrek's um, based on, on kind of what I'm seeing from, uh, you know, just the general AT standpoint. That AT half-track is definitely going to be a pain in the butt. It's got 9 infantry kills, and I don't believe that he's spending munitions on focus fire. No, I don't think so. Um, he's definitely he's definitely not spending the munitions on that. He's only got a uh, 94 at the moment. However, you gotta uh, think what else he might be using it for. The incendiary grenades, perhaps. Um, I do believe what we saw was a grenade from the riflemen. So the riflemen have their grenades uh, grenade ability unlocked. Yes, they do. And, right. Uh, you know, and that's that's kind of a counter to. Um, the incendiary grenades and again it, it's a good choice for when you're dealing with a lot of infantry this way something to note is the amount of offensive veterancy that cod has put on a lot of his troops regardless of whether they're g43 or otherwise um, a, a lot of times you'd see that if you're expecting those squads to go uh, panzer shrek so uh, you know i'm expecting to see um the uh, shrek upgrade come out eventually even though right now we have the mortar half track that i was talking about earlier even though he has an offensive uh, vet on him, I don't think he's even worried about the fact that um, he's they're not Panzer Shreks. It's just due to the fact that, as we saw him earlier, he was retreating to his base, getting them all healed up, getting them reinforced, and he's just going to be keep on keep on doing this. He's going to make sure that his guys are at uh, full health, and then he's obviously going to have very offensive capability. Um, having so many PGs on the field has really given him quite the edge in terms of uh, putting up a fight against the. Uh, against the Americans. He's managed to capture a lot of territory at the moment. Um, if we're looking at the Americans' base, what is this? I see a tank depot. Now, what could be actually coming out of there, Ryan? Well, you've got M10 coming out of there right now, and it's a it's a great counter to the AT half-track and anything else that's out on the field. Uh, you can squish infantry with it. You know, there's, there's a lot of options that way, and, and I think that's one of the reasons why um, I foresee Shrek's and Cot's future is because the American did have the fuel advantage for for a decent majority of the game, and so you have to expect. Uh, you know, you haven't seen bars. You've seen a grenade up uh, upgrade. Um, you know, he's got a triage because his stuff was coming out full health. But past that, um, he really hasn't spent a lot of fuel. So I'm expecting to see this M10 um, get tread broken here, as the uh, AT half track looks like it's actually pulling up into position. Um, trying to save this mortar half track, and uh, and so you know now the question is what what is Cot going to do against the uh, field repairability that actually just got popped, which means we have an armor company doctrine chosen from the Americans. Well, I'll tell you what he's going to do. He actually chose the tank destroyer doctrine, and then he went for his Hetzer. Uh, so not a bad choice whatsoever. If he has a light AT half-track and he has the Hetzer fighting against this um, tank destroyer, then obviously it's going to be doing a lot of damage. Um, it's doing a very good job. The M10 is just about taken out. So I think this is what uh, Kotz was actually waiting for, because he was actually keeping his... Um, his command point saved up and he was just waiting for what the American might pull out and as soon as he saw that wrench coming down the field repairs he decided to bring out the tank destroyer doctrine I don't know about you but I have those moments in games where uh, I'm, I finally see a doctrine choice by my opponent but I'm in the middle of a fight you know similar to the way that this whole game has been and uh, I'm in the middle of a fight and I have to quick choose my doctrine to try and bring out a cap, uh, you know, uh, out a counter to whatever it is that I'm seeing on the field. And, uh, you know, that, that screen, for whatever reason, gives me hell. <laughs> what do you mean by hell? As in, like, lag or something? Uh, just, no, just choosing the doctrine itself, uh, you know, going through and having to click the little accept buttons and all of that stuff. It is stuff. kind of an inefficient, not... isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it definitely feels a little... Uh, ugly to me uh, but uh, you know these guys are, are literally it's just a snap judgment they go in they click through it it's fantastic play 
<laughs> so the G43's um, uh, p suppressing, should I say, this rifleman squad, whilst the mortar half track is just bombarding them with mortar shells. The light AT or the anti tank gun is moving in on the Hetzer, so the Hetzer is just getting out of there. Obviously, a bit careful about what is um, happening on the field. And it's kind of looking bleak for the Americans at the moment. There's still a lot of time left in this replay, so still open to what could happen. Um, the Americans are down to 271 points, and the Wehrmacht are up to 338 points. So, the Ver or the uh, not the Wehrmacht, the PE are actually doing quite a decent job in terms of the victory points, and that's just due to the fact that they have so many PGs on the field, um, have been maintaining this constant aggressive state on the riflemen, and you always got this uh, passive Kenton crowd that is capping away <laughs> um, all the time. Yeah, and I wouldn't be surprised to see something armored just go run down a Ketten Crad just for the hell of it. Um, and, uh, you know, just to keep that capping from happening. But he's got a Sherman out now. Um, the Sherman's going to fare mm, uh, less well against the Hetzer overall, especially with ATHT support. Um, he kind of tipped his hand there a little bit by shooting at those PGs, although it's not a bad idea to get a squad off the field. Um, and I, I think it's it's one of those things where, depending on how it's played and how the timing comes out, we got three CPs saved up by Armstrong. So, uh, you know, if if things come out at the right times, that Sherman could have quite an effect on the field. Right. Um, could I just ask you one thing? Just um, answer this question. Uh, how much fuel does the American have? Thirty-eight. Okay, so basically the Sherman, <laughs> it's obviously, it's, it's a good tank. It's obviously not going to do much against the frontal armor of the Hetzer. Um, he, can't, he can't even get his upgrade to upgun these Shermans. I mean, it's obviously going to be too expensive to even think about going for that since he's so deprived on fuel at the moment. Um, the good thing is, however, he has that uh, tank doctrine. So he's going down the left-hand side of it. He's got the field repairs. And he's going to be getting a Pershing eventually. That is why uh, he's gone down that route. But this is looking a bit iffy for the Americans at the moment because his Sherman has been tread broken. However, at least there is an AT gun in front of it. But the PGs are closing in to perhaps try and take out the AT gun. Hmm, what could happen? Well, uh, you get uh, the uh, incendiary barrage coming down. Um, between that and the PG's AT guns going down with four-man squads, I, ex I expect to see that AT gun actually, uh, you know, taken. Um, and uh, although he may decide to just kind of stall back and watch for infantry, uh, he's done a great job at really thinning out the American infantry. I mean, the Americans down to three rifle squads. Ouch, and when you're looking at how much he has, the uh, PE has five squads at the moment. Um, some of them down to one man, some of them down to two men, so they need to get repaired up. And this is what you were talking about, the PE taking that AT gun, however not actually managing to be able to do that. And oh no, oh my god, that veteran C2 PE squad was taken out. Oh no. Oh my god. <laughs> that is just, you know, between the, the increased damage from that grenade and the, uh, you know, the triple vet squad just firing at that, that grenade placement was great, it caught it caught them on the retreat, it was actually oh thrown behind the, the Panzer Grenadiers as opposed to right at them. Oh my god, that was painful to look at. If we saw what happened there, it was a sort of one sweeping m movement, the rifleman taking out the AT gun, then moving, then right away, it was just an instant flick of that grenade behind the cover of the uh, PE, and just taking them out. They lost uh, one guy there in that uh, grenade explosion, and just when the guys were retreating, they just paused there, and that's one of the most frustrating things about the game. When something like that happens, you guys just freeze before they actually start retreating, and that little fro freeze and, uh, frozen opportunity let the riflemen actually finish them off. So very painful to see that happen to a uh, Veterans Day 2 squad. Um, another M10 on the field, and oh my god, Ryan! <laughs> we'll see no. something about that. That was a teller mine actually placed <laughs> on the AT gun, so that as he picked it up, he lost an entire Vet 2 squad oh um, to that teller mine in combination. So uh, that's a pretty. Was that the Vet 3 squad? 
Um, was, that was the Vet 3 squad. Oh my god, that's even a bigger loss for the Americans. So if we're talking about, for the new people that might have thought, uh, not recognized what happened there, um, that that uh, teller mine th uh, took out the rifleman. The uh, and if you're <laughs> if you know the PE, sorry, if you know the PE, the teller mines can't actually take out infantry. It's they're only activated by tanks, and the AT gun is actually classified as a tank. So when they went over that, boom! Big explosion took out the AT gun and the rifleman. Very painful to see that veteran C3 with the uh, with the. Uh Bringing out of a, a second tank on the American side, you know, one of the things that a, that Cot did to counter that was he brought out a second Hetzer. He lost one Hetzer in that encounter, though, which just goes to show you, you know, the turreted tanks really do a great job against those fixed turret tanks, uh, relatively speaking, especially without um, a real concerted support from the AT half tracks. Uh, that's one of those moments where you have to make the call whether you're going to bring out um, munitions half track to keep the AT half tracks timer recharged or whether you're just going to continue to bring out more concerted AT. Well, the nice thing about going for that logistic company is that you can actually get in the. Um, a munitions half track from there, but and funnily enough, he's actually uh, producing a scout car from there. So um, I'm guessing he's going to be using that to put it down on some sort of fuel point because he's only got a. Actually, why would he put put it on the fuel point? Um, probably on a munitions yeah, point. I'm guessing that's going to go on munitions at this point. Yeah. Um, the American player is actually saving up his manpower for a Pershing call in. Um, that's going to be pretty tough to uh, cope with from the Panzer Elite right now. Um, obviously, you can still tread break it, but the interesting thing is that the AT half track has a chance to bounce its shots and not penetrate the frontal armor of a Pershing, even with tread break. Okay, so that Pershing might have a difficult time. And rightly so, I mean, as long as that light like, AT half track there is there, anything is going to have a difficult time. Um, so has this light AT, I'm not sure if you were seeing it or not, has this light AT half-track just been going in and, in and out of the base to recharge its ability? Yeah, and that's that's common play after you've uh, removed an M8 from the field or done something like that. If you have defensive operations, just turn around, run it back to your base, bring it back out to the field while there's nothing major going on. And uh, so he's been uh, constantly recharging that timer so that he does have a good, you can see as soon as he gets in, sight range he's pulling up um and there we see that non-penetrating shot that we were just talking about um definitely kind of sad to see uh you know it not get tread broken this is actually quite a funny thing i think it might have missed because it had two shots just consecutively um beside each other um could have possibly missed that tread breaker i believe that might have been the second shot no the the tread breaker actually has a chance to not penetrate the pershing's front armor and it just bounces Right, I thought that might have been the second shot shot that was the Treadbreaker, but oh well. Um, the two Hetzers combating the Pershing, but obviously the Pershing is not tread broken, So it's still going to be able to move, and that is the most important thing at the moment against two Hetzers. So this uh, Sherman, rightly so, is getting in on the uh, Hetzers, whilst the light AT half-track, where is it? Hmm. Is it's, it back it's on the field? Right up next to the Sherman there it there. is. There it is. Indeed, so it has uh, gone to its base to recharge, and now it has that Treadbreaker ability on the Sherman. So, like seeing that sort of stuff, the Pershing is already down to less than a half health, getting repaired by the engineers, but not looking the absolute best for the PE at the moment. The Hetzer is taking a lot of damage, uh, some few frontal armor shots, and oh my god! Penetrating frontal armor shot on the Hetzer, taking the rest of its health out, and that is it gone. This, this Pershing is so menacing, it, um, you just look at its shots on the field and it's just these huge explosions um, when it crashes on the ground. Also massive penetrating uh, forces against the Hetzers. Um, this is looking kind of bad for the PE at the moment, they're getting chased down. What they really could use is some more Treadbreaker, but it doesn't look like it's going to be coming anytime soon. No, and, and this is obviously one of the uh, the big downfalls to the Hetzers not being turreted, getting circle struck by this Pershing. Um, he lost at least one PG squad there in that engagement to the rifles. Actually, I think he lost more than that because I see three on the field, so yep. I believe he lost two. Mm -hmm. So he should, uh, yep, he lost two in that uh, engagement. 
The thing to note, however, the two hatches are down and the tanks or the Americans are doing quite a decent job in uh, counter-attacking. However, they don't have much in terms of strategic points and even more, they don't have much in terms of points. They have only 62 points left, so this is kind of becoming iffy. What's going to happen next? Um, is the Americans going to keep on pushing with what they have or is it going to come down to a VPU win? Who knows? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually really surprised to see the uh, the uh, Panzer Elite's manpower income being up at 311. 309? Um, that just might be due to the fact that, uh, to be honest, there's not even that many Panzer Grandiers on the field anymore. There's just a few vehicles. Um, just, I guess, it's that high, really. Yeah, that's an incredible rate, though. Surprising but useful at the same time. So maybe it's just due to the fact that there's a few strategic points in their hands. If you look at um, there's four, so that's an extra plus twelve all in, all in total. Yeah, you would expect someone keep to kick in though. I mean, the Americans at uh, 230 manpower income right now, and uh, so that difference alone is going to make a very large difference as the game goes on. He's down to uh, a 10 munitions income, which means that the the field repairs that he popped earlier while he was chasing down the Hetzer with the Pershing um, is uh, a very long way off at this point. I mean, you're talking about uh, 20 minutes. That's very long. Um, and we're looking at the PE uh, income, and they've got plus 81 for their munitions. Uh, that's why has plenty. They're obviously going to be having um, a very easy time to possibly finish this off. The Pershing, I mean, it can't even get repaired up at the moment, and it's just having a difficult time. It's just a sitting duck at the moment. Whilst the Hetzers are getting repaired, uh, at, should I say, a very fast rate as well. So I wouldn't doubt if there's some sort of uh, advanced repair on those PGs. Um, the Hetzer can obviously now get back on in there and take on that Pershing, finish it off once and for all. Yeah, and between that and the AT grenades that we saw, we saw by the Panzer Grenadiers earlier, um, one of the things that uh, Simon's going to really have to be careful about at this point is the tread break and the AT grenades. Once those are used in combination uh, along with Hetzers, you're going to have a hard time breaking that line with tanks. I think uh, I think Simon's actually gonna have a very hard time even doing anything at the moment. I mean, his tanks are just about to go down. Uh, there's a huge advantage for the PE in terms of resources, and you just look at what Simon has left, and it's really not that much. He's got barely any points, and this is looking very very dire for him. It's gonna be very difficult for him to even recover from this if he's losing so much and if he has no um, resource income. Yeah, and it, it looks like he's saving up manpower again, maybe for another Pershing. Um, I, I don't know that that's going to do you a whole lot of good at this point, but, uh, you know, why not? How else are you going to combat anything? I think the only thing you could really do in um, Simon's position is to probably go for that Pershing and set up some defensive lines that you could force your enemy to walk into you. So, say, some mines or something like that. Um, that's the only thing I can think of at the moment, but really when you're in such a position with hardly any infantry, hardly any units, it's just going to be so difficult to even recover anyway. Um, what Simon really has to be worried of is the VPs. 52 points and they're going to be ticking down really fast now since two of them are in the hands of the PE. Yeah, and we have, uh, you know, very little in the way of, of infantry, and if, uh, you know, it's it's kind of one of those classic things that boots on the ground is what actually wins wars. Well, the you know, that's true to a large extent, even in Company of Heroes, you have to be able to hold territory, and the only way that you can do that is with light vehicles and infantry um, if you've gone armored company because you can capture with raid. Uh, that's not going to do you a whole lot of good necessarily against all of the AT and everything going on, but the immobilization of the Pershing there, the the Sherman going down, um, the American players is in a sad spot. Well, I'd like to say that the game is over. We have a Yag Panther coming on the field. <laughs> um, so this is really just going to seal the deal for the uh, PE. Whatever the Americans are going to throw out in terms of armor, it's just it's not going to matter anymore. Uh, even the Pershing, it's just going to be absolutely combated by the Hetzers, the light AT half-track. 
Uh, the Yag Panther, and I think it's just going to be possibly a big swoop that could go into the American space and just finish them off once and for all. But then again, that depends if uh, it could be a VP win or a base annihilation win. Yeah, I, I doubt you're going to see a base annihilation. I uh, I firmly believe that when this person goes down, Simon will just quit. <laughs> I think so as well. And that is it. It's game ga uh, good game from both players. And so what we saw... Yep, that's a playback over. So what we saw in the first game was that Cut was actually pushed back and lost his first initial game. But however, he made a comeback as the PE in the second game this time around. So well done to Cut for managing to do that and put Simon down to uh, down a game. So that means 1-1 one, one to each player and it's going to be going on to the third round. And whoever can win that obviously moves on. Um, anything else you'd like to mention? Nope, not at all. It was great play. It's, you know, I mean, it's always good to see um, classic strats going in different directions and uh, taking, you know, just moments for things like the AT grenade on, a, or not the AT grenade, the teller mine on the AT gun. Um, you know, little details like that can make a big difference because if he happens to capture that gun with a Vet 3 squad, it might die. Um, and, <laughs> you know, it, and getting that American Vet is just key. <laughs> Obviously, and that was very uh, cool stuff to see, little uh, details, just um, nice sort of stuff that you appreciate in this game. So nothing really surprising uh, in terms of strategies here, but then again, both very good players, and turns out the cult was the victor. So anyway, we will be seeing you guys very shortly in Game 3.